Thank you for how far you've brought us. Thank you for your kindness. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. God is good. And all the time. Glory be to God. What a faithful God we serve. He's been so kind to us. He's brought us to the 12th month of the year. It's a year everybody keeps saying it's been a challenging year for them. But for us in the faith, it's been an awesome year. Amen. Glory be to God. And to God alone be all the glory for how far he's brought us. I want to believe that somebody is excited Amen. for all that God has done for them. Yes, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want you to prepare your hearts tonight because the Lord is going to visit someone. God is going to visit someone in an unusual dimension. Paul was preaching. And whilst Paul was preaching, the Bible says that there was a man who had faith to receive. He had faith to receive. So that means when the word is going forth, for the word to work in your life, you must have faith to receive. And not only that, you must believe the word. For the word that you believe is what is accrued into your account. The word that you believe is what is accrued into your account. And whilst the man had faith to receive, all of a sudden, he received the miracle he was believing God for. So if you are going to have an encounter with the word, you must have faith to receive. And not only that, you must believe the word. Because just one word from God will change your life. The woman with the issue of blood said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. So that means it is your responsibility to take a faith step or a faith action. You must believe in your heart that this prophetic encounter is destined to change your life is destined to transform your life, is destined because you see one thing, the Bible says in the book of John chapter 7 verse 37, the Bible says that on the last day, Jesus cried, the last day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What is the last day? This prophetic encounter is the last prophetic encounter for 2020. So it's the last one. And Jesus said, the last day, the great day of the feast, he cried with a loud voice and said, if anyone thirst, you see, you must be thirsty to have an encounter with the word. And with that thirst comes a transformation. If anyone thirsts, if you are thirsty tonight, there shall be no impossibilities in your life. If you can believe, all things will be possible for you. So I want you to open your heart. I want you to open your mind. I want you to believe God for the next level because it's your season to break through. It's your season for turn around. God will do in your life tonight what you have never experienced before. Tonight, you have a raw encounter with the word of God. So just for one minute, I want you to talk to God and ask God to give you a word. Ask the Lord to give you a word. This is a prophetic encounter. Ask the Lord to give you a word. A word from heaven. A word from the throne of grace. Ask God to give you a word. A word that will change your situation. A word that will turn that situation around. 
Ask him to give you a word. 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 Ask him to speak. Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. Speak, Lord, for we hear it. Our heart is open. Our heart is a good ground. Sow your word on a good ground. And let it bear hundredfold, hundredfold fruit, hundredfold fruit in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, it is done. Every man or every woman you read about in the Bible, they had an encounter with the word. The Bible says that God sent a word into Jacob and he lighted into Israel. He sent a word into Jacob, that word turned him into Israel. So just one word can turn you from nothing to something great. Just one word. Just one word. Even God could not do anything without his word. That's why the Bible says that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. So we must have a desire to have an encounter with the word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, turn with me please in Psalm 26, verse 7. Psalm 26, verse 7. It says that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. And we are blessed by the reading of God's word. I'm continuing with the message I started yesterday that I have titled, Thanksgiving, Gateway to Wondrous Works. Thanksgiving, Gateway to Wondrous Works. And this is part two. Please understand that God is a God who demands thanksgiving from us. And it's through thanksgiving that we do exploits and mysteries in the kingdom. Because there is power in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a mystery many have not caught. Because the Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Psalm 100 verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That means without thanksgiving, you are not qualified to have access into the presence of God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. So it takes thanksgiving to enter into the presence of God. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So thanksgiving takes you in. Thanksgiving sustains you in his courts. Be thankful to him and bless his name. That's why those who come to God in thanksgiving never lack any good thing. And I prophesy over you today, anything that has not worked in your life this year, through this mystery of thanksgiving, your life will be transformed radically in the name of Jesus. I said your life will be transformed drastically and radically to the glory of God in the mighty name of Jesus. Because thanksgiving is a mystery. Through thanksgiving, God releases wondrous works. Wondrous works. Wondrous works. And you have come into your season of wondrous works. Enough of living an ordinary life. You have come into your season of wondrous works in the name of Jesus. Write this down. When God shows you his mercies, his goodness, and his kindness to you, you don't have... you and you don't appreciate or value it, this is what happens to you. If God, or when God shows you his mercies, his kindness, and his goodness to you, 
and you don't appreciate or value it, this is what happens to you. Psalm 28 verse 5. Are you ready for this? Psalm 28 verse 5. It says, because they they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the oppression of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. What is God talking about? God is talking about those who don't thank him for all he's done for them. I've seen people that God have done great and mighty things for them, and they are just casual about it. They don't understand what thanksgiving means. For instance, if God gives you a job or God promotes you or God adds a year, another year onto your year, or God delivers you from accident, or God heals you, you are obligated to thank God. Are you following me? And how do you thank God? Listen, your thanksgiving is not complete until you give an offering. Are you following what I'm saying? Your thanksgiving is never complete until you give God an offering. So every time God does something for you, you have to understand what he has done for you and and honor the Lord on the proportion of what he's done for you. So Psalm 28 verse 5, it says, because they do not regard the works of the Lord. Who are they who don't regard the works of the Lord? Those that God has done something great for. And unfortunately, the world, the world system understand this. They understand this better. Go to the, the, the dark well, the occultic well. When they go to whoever they are, their master to request for something to be done for them and they get powers or whatever and they go and accomplish whatever they've gone for, they go back with an offering to go and thank that, that small God. But unfortunately, many Christians don't understand this. And thanksgiving is one thing God doesn't play with. And tonight we're going to see how God demands thanksgiving from us. So every time God does something for you, every time God blesses you, God promotes you, it is mandated that you honor God. The Lord, there are 10,000 people who could have gotten this job. But you gave it to me. It's not because of your qualification. There are others who are more qualified than you. God delivered you from that accident. And you didn't even come to God and say, Father, thank you for delivering me from this accident with an offering. Because your thanksgiving is not complete until you give God an offering. So he said, because they do not regard the works of the Lord. What are the works of that? Just look into your life. What God has done for you this year. You are not in the 12th month by accident. You are here by the mercies of God. You are here because of the kindness of God. So you owe God thanks. You and I owe God thanks. He said, because they do not regard the works of the Lord nor the oppression of his hands. My God, some of us this year, the hand of the Lord, the oppressions of the hand of the Lord rescued us from the jaws of lions, rescued us from the jaws of bears. I saw a a clip somewhere, I think, I don't know where I saw it, but I saw there was a, there was a, a, a woman who was running, early morning run, and then there was a bear. That went and was smelling this woman. A bear. A bear. And finally, I don't know what happened. Probably the bear froze and this woman was able to walk away quietly and fled. A bear. A bear. That's the hand of God in operation. The hand of God has rescued her from the jaws of that bear. I saw another one, a lion. This guy was running early morning, and then all of a sudden, a lion in the bush. That's why you have to be careful where you run. A lion. And he was taking, he was taking a video clip. The lion was charging on him. Was he a lion or a cheetah? Or I don't know, a tiger, whatever. Was charging on him for close to about five minutes. 
thank God, finally, that animal went away. That's the hand of the Lord that has rescued you from that death bed. Some of you, this year, you had brushes with COVID. But God delivered you. But you haven't come back to thank God with an offering for all he's done for you. No wonder the world is above many Christians. It's sad. Because many Christians are too casual about the things of God. They are too casual. I had a testimony of a man of God, Dr. Paul Nietzsche. He said he prayed for a lady in the church many years ago when the church was just small, a small church. And um, this lady, you know, came to him, prayed for her, and then she got a big contract in millions. And then when it's time for her to tithe, she sent a message. She sent a message to Dr. Paul in it through somebody to say, the tithe is too big for that church, for his church. Wow. The same place where you were prayed for. The same God, big God, that gave you that contract through that church. Now you've got the contract. You are telling the man of God that the church is too small for this tithe. My God. And guess what she did? She divided the tithe into, <laughs> into 10 and gave it to somebody to go and pay in different churches. These were not churches she was going to. But the moment she got the contract, she remembered that those churches are bigger than Dr. Paul in his church. Guess what? He said, the person the lady gave the tithe to, to go and pay in those churches, the person devoured the tithe. The person became a devourer and she, she lost that contract. She lost everything and today she's nothing. Please hear me. Whenever God does something for you, do not forget. When he does something for you, when he delivers you out of an accident, if he promotes you, he promotes your business, he expands your business, learn to give God thanks. Glory be to God. We are not where we are today because of what we have. We are here because of the goodness of the Lord. So Psalm 28 verse 5 says, Because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the oppression of his hands, he shall destroy them. My God. He shall destroy them and not build them up. So you see what happens when you don't acknowledge what God has done for you and appreciate him. Five characteristics of those who don't give thanks. Five characteristics of those who don't give thanks. Number one. Those who don't give thanks are arrogant. Mm. <laughs> Those who don't give thanks are arrogant. <laughs> I say, what shall I give thanks for? You are arrogant. <laughs> Five characteristics of those who don't give thanks. Number one, those who don't give thanks are arrogant. They don't see anything to thank God for. They said, I have achieved this by my degree. You have not achieved this by your degree. There are many out there who are more qualified than you. Listen, there are many in this church who are more qualified than me to do what I'm doing. But because of some of them, their level of arrogance and pride, God has not appointed them. So those who don't give thanks are arrogant, number one. Glory be to God. Number two, number two characteristics of those who don't give thanks. Those who don't give thanks are ungrateful. Those who don't give thanks are ungrateful. And you've always heard me say, ungrateful people shall never prosper. Those who don't give thanks are ungrateful. Glory be to God. Number three, those who don't give thanks are proud. You never see proud people giving thanks. When it's time for thanksgiving service, you never see them there. <laughs> they are very proud. Very, very proud. 
Those who don't give thanks are proud. Number four, those who don't give thanks think that they deserve better than you have done for them. They always think that they they deserve better. You give them food. They say, what is this? You bless them with something. They say, what is this? Those who don't give thanks, they think they deserve better than you have done for them. And there are some ungrateful husbands and ungrateful wives like that. I've seen video short video clips where a husband goes to buy a car for the wife and the wife is saying, what is this? What is this? You see, those who don't give thanks think they deserve better than you have done for them. If you had the money, you could have bought the car yourself. Why don't you thank God for that little car? and it will expand and become a big car. Those who don't give thanks, they think they deserve better than you have done for them. Nobody owes you anything. God, as a a matter of fact, you and I owe God everything. We owe God everything. Even the breath you are breathing, you owe him. If he has to charge you per second, can we pay? (laughs) <laughs> uh, we won't be able to pay number five those who don't give thanks think they all think you owe them something number five those who don't give thanks think you owe them something so when you do something for them like like a, a wife goes to work work very hard Come home, you the husband, you are home doing nothing. You've lifted, just watching Netflix, Netflix all day. Your wife comes back from from work, work hard, tired. She comes to cook for you. She puts the food on the dinner table for you. And you don't say thank you. You are an ungrateful husband. Those who don't give thanks think you owe them something. They think, ah, after all, you owe me to cook for me. Who said that? Says who? Says who? Where is it written in the Bible where it says the kitchen belongs to the wife or the woman? Where is it written in the Bible? Just look for it and bring it to me. Maybe I haven't read it. Those who don't give thanks think you owe them something. So every time you do something for them, they are ungrateful. They won't appreciate it. They won't appre- Don't think even as your pastor, I owe you anything. After I've preached to you and you have been blessed, I've prayed for you, you owe me thanks. You owe me thanks. You need to thank God for my life and say, oh, Father, I thank God for the life of my man of God. I thank God for my woman of God. Thank you, Lord. Continue to bless them. You owe me thanks. You owe me thanks. I'm telling you today, you owe me thanks. You owe me thanks. You owe me thanks. I have been diligent preaching from the lockdown, three services every Sunday, weekday services, prophetic encounter, feeding you all the time so you not backslide. So your brain will be, it's sanity, you will have sanity. By now, if I was not preaching to you, some of you by now, you'll be insane. You owe me thanks. You owe me thanks. You owe me thanks. Glory be to God. And after I, I pray so hard, I don't even see your offering. <laughs> I don't even see your offering. <laughs> At least the little you can do is say, Father, oh, bless my man of God. This is a little offering. I don't see your offering. <laughs> Uh, but it has never discouraged me. I have been preaching. I'm preaching not for your offering. Now, don't get me wrong now. Somebody say, oh, 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 pastor is preaching for, no, I'm not preaching for your offering. I'm not preaching for your offering. I am not preaching for your offering. I'm preaching because I have been compelled. I have been mandated. This is my mandate. This is my commission. This is what God has commissioned me to do. 
Glory be to God. That's why Paul said, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For necessity is laid upon me to preach this gospel. You owe me thanks. You owe me thanks. There are too many ungrateful Christians out there. Too many, too many. They don't appreciate their pastors. They ask, as a matter of fact, they will go and put me on social media now. They will cut this small portion I've said and say, ah, the pastor is preaching for money. Now, they will start castigating me in, on, on social media, different ones, platforms now. I know. I know. I know. I know. As if somebody has called you to be a dissector, an analyzer, and a critic of what I'm preaching. <laughs> so let's go and look at what happens to those who don't give thanks. Four, five things, those who don't give thanks. Number one, those who don't give thanks are always frustrated. <laughs> those who don't give thanks, they are always frustrated. You see them, they live a frustrated life. Frustrated, they are always hustling. <laughs> they wake up early and go to bed late. Hustling, frustrated. Nothing is working. Nothing is working. Why will anything work in your life if you're not being grateful to God? These are what the things that happen to those who don't give thanks. Number one, they are always frustrated. Have you come across people who you haven't done anything and all of a sudden they snap? They get upset. You're wondering, what did I do? What did I say? That's those who don't give thanks. They are always frustrated. They are always frustrated. Number two, what happens to those who don't give thanks? They never live long. <laughs> those who don't give thanks, they never live long. I am yet to see a non thanksgiver live long. Their life is always short, 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 short. Short life. Those who don't give thanks never live long. Yesterday I said to you, when we give thanks, thanksgiving prolong what God has given us. Prolongs what you have. So when you thank God, you live a life of fulfillment. Long life and prosperity becomes your portion. Number three, what happens to those who don't give thanks? Number three, they never get promoted in life. <laughs> They never get promoted in life. They are in the same place 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. When they are about to go on pension, the company collapses. <laughs> uh, they are never promoted in life because they are not thanksgivers. Number four, those who don't give thanks never progress in life. They never progress in life. They are at the same place. Stand still. Mr. Go Slow. It's the same place. You travel and come 10 years later, they are at the same place. No progress. As a matter of fact, they are deteriorating. Their life is going down. They never progress in life. People who don't give thanks never progress in life. So my dear sister, my dear brother, start giving God thanks now. Change your ways and start giving God thanks now. I said change your ways and start giving God thanks now. Don't allow these things to imprison your future, to, to put you in a place where you are, you are not progressing. Number five. What happens to those who don't give thanks? Number one, number five, they never prosper in life. Those who don't give thanks never prosper in life. Remember I told you that when God does something for you and you thank him, he'll do more? It's the same with human beings. If I do something for you and you don't thank me, I won't do it for you again. There are many people, there are, there are many, there are pastors I've invited to this commission to come and preach after I've sown seed, heavy seed in their life. They never call to say thank you. I say, you are never coming back again. Never, never, never. 
Even if I hear God say, invite him, I'll never invite him again. Because they are ungrateful people. They are ungrateful people. You preach for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour, and we sow a huge seed in your life, not compared to what you can earn in one day or one month, and they don't call to say, oh, pastor, thank you. They don't. But I've seen great men of God, major men of God, big men of God who have come to preach in this commission. You sow a little seed, a little, and they are so grateful. They are so, they are thanking you. They are telling everybody. And sometimes you wonder, my God, look, those who have made it, those who are up there, big impact men of God have come to preach and you've sown a little seed and they are so grateful because they understand but the little little ones they come because of money the little little ones even when they come and preach you don't see the head from the tail you don't see the nose from the eyes of what they have preached and you sow a seed in their life and they are not grateful they are not grateful. God will always test what's in your heart. Yeah. I've had many occasions where I've tested many of my pastors. Tested to see what's in their heart. Many of them. Many of them. Giving them opportunities. And to see how they will behave. So giving them things and some of them don't say thank you. I say, okay, another year is coming. You won't get. I give you this. You don't say thank you. Ah, you'll be here. You'll have a thankless life forever. So you have to be, I'll teach you. Thanksgiving have to be prompt. Malachi chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. Malachi chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Thanksgiving has to be prompt and timely. Listen to what God said. God says, oh now, oh priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name. What does that mean? To give glory to my name means to thank me, says the Lord of hosts. Look at what happens to those who don't thank God promptly. God says, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. So please hear me. When you don't, God doesn't joke with thanksgiving. When you don't thank God, he places a curse on you. <laughs> Don't joke with thanksgiving. Jesus healed 10 lepers. Only one came back. And every time you see 10 in the Bible, it's a test. 10 plagues in Egypt. 10% tithe. 10 lepers. 10 virgins. Every time you see 10 in the Bible, it's a test. God is testing what's in your heart. So those who don't give thanks, they never prosper. They never prosper. You want to prosper? Start thanking God. Thank God for that one P. Thank God for that 10 pounds they are paying you now. And then you move to 50 pounds. But if you don't, you say, what is this? God, I've served you. I've prayed. <laughs> and you are not grateful. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I tell, I, I, I said to someone the other day that people have no idea what comes into this commission in terms of tithes and offerings. Many people have no idea. Can I tell you the truth? Sometimes when we are having service online, maybe one or two people are just giving, just one or two people. But just that one or two people I've learned to thank God for those one or two people. And through that one or two people, they are little giving. God has multiplied it to do major things across the globe. 
So if you don't thank God for the little, God will not bring you the much. You are where you are now because you are not giving God thanks. You are not moving to the next level. It's time to thank God. There are people in this commission who work so hard. And people ask them, do, do they pay you? No, we pay them through thanksgiving. Amen. Dedicated, committed with their entire life. If you call for one month service from morning to evening, they will be in all the services. Dedicated. You see, because what God is doing here, there's no man's hand in it. There's no man's hand in it. Even if I'm not here, God will make it to happen. The day I begin to think that I'm the reason behind what is happening here, he will remove me. The glory will depart. Listen, write this down. Without thanksgiving, nothing can be full in your life. Without thanksgiving, nothing can be full in your life. You want things to be full in your life? Start thanking God. Because without thanksgiving, nothing will be full in your life. That's why the Bible says that it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Psalm 92 verse 1. It says, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. So giving thanks unto the Lord at all times and in every situation is a good thing. Say amen to that. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. I said it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. That's why giving thanks unto the Lord at all times in every situation is a good thing. Give thanks at all time and in every situation is a good thing. For some of you parents who have children, you give your children something and they don't say thank you. You look at them. As a matter of fact, one of the key things, virtues, every parent teaches their children is to learn to say thank you. You give them water, you ask, what do you say? Mm -hmm. They have to say thank you. You give them a sweet, what do you say? Thank you. You give them money, what do they say? Thank you. You are teaching them how to appreciate in life, how to increase in life through thanksgiving. That's why God demands thanksgiving from us. God demands thanksgiving from us. Psalm 150 verse 6, the Bible says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That is God demanding thanksgiving. God said, let everything, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Who gave you the breath is the Lord. So God is demanding thanksgiving in response to what he has given you and I. So he said, let everything that has breath do what? Praise the Lord. God demands thanksgiving from us. That's why ungrateful people can never prosper. I'm telling you where I am today, the mystery is in thanksgiving. When we started the church, just two of us and a little child, we started thanking God. Father, thank you. When we get to church, there's nobody, but we'll thank God. When we come home, we'll thank God. Father, thank you for the multitude you brought to church today. Father, thank you for the multitude. There was no one, but I was saying thank you for the multitudes you brought today. Thank you for the harvest. I was rejoicing. Then God will bring one person and then my rejoicing goes to the next level. I will rejoice and rejoice and rejoice. I said, wow, God, you brought one. Oh my God. I will praise him like never before. And God will say, ah, this one understands what it means to thank you. And then God started expanding the church. The church where very good people told me it can never flourish 
from this same place, the church is reaching the world. Glory be to God. That's thanksgiving. Bishop Oedipo said uh, he will thank God so much for the little people who come to church. Eight people come to church, you thank God. And then one day the wife came to the church because where the church was was far. One day the wife came, there were eight people or eight and a half. <laughs> Nine, the ninth one was not serious. He was not very committed. He's a half member. And then when they came, when the wife came, the wife said, they finished the service. The wife said, where are all the members? I said, can't you see? Can't you see the multitudes? He said in those days, they had more benches than empty benches than people. He was so joyous. He was so excited for the eight and a half. And today, look, God has multiplied that church. On a Sunday, there's almost up to over near 400,000 people coming to church on a Sunday. Build the largest church auditorium in one year, 52,000 seater in one year, in one year, through the mystery of thanksgiving. Listen, you and I owe God thanks. There is nothing in your hands or nothing in my hands that, that we have not received. Through the mercies of God. Many of us in this commission still have jobs. Many have been made redundant. But there are many of you who are still not tithing. That's unbelievable. <laughs> you still have a job. In the midst of this crisis, you still have a job. Due to the covering over this commission, you still have a job until now. You haven't started tithing. Ah, I don't know what kind of human being you are. I don't know what kind of human being you are. Unfortunately, when these such people start having crisis, that's when they know God. We know your games. We know your games. We didn't start church today. We didn't start church today. You know, when you need something from us, you will know. You start commenting on our post. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. But when you're not in trouble, we don't see you. I mean, when everything is happening for you, we don't see your brake light at the church car park. Yet it's this same church that prayed for you to get that car. (laughs) Sad. We know your tricks. You can't fool God. You can fool man, but you can't fool God. You can't fool God. There are people who come to the church and say, oh, pastor, help us, help us, do this, help us, pastor. We'll pay, we'll pay, we'll pay. Pastor, after we help them financially, they forget. (laughs) They forget. Those who forget. Well, I'm preaching good tonight. It's the last prophetic encounter for the year. I'm teaching you what God is telling you. Maybe next year you'll change your ways. As a matter of fact, you owe God thanks. So tomorrow being the last prophetic encounter for the year, you ought to bring God a special thanksgiving offering. To say, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you've done for me the whole of the year till date. Thank you, Lord. You owe God thanks. You owe God. Remember, your thanksgiving is not complete until you sow an offering. Is the church in need? No. Is the pastor in need? No. I told one of my pastors, people who go and criticize pastors and say they are are chopping the church offering. How much at all can a pastor spend? How much can he eat? Say, I want to eat the church money. And I go for breakfast. How much is breakfast? How much is breakfast? Four pounds something. McDonald's breakfast. Four pounds something. If you go to the high-end breakfast, maybe 15 pounds or 30 pounds. That's all. How, How much at all can the pastors barely take out of the church money? Are you following what I'm saying? I told him that people who criticize men of God out there, they have no idea. 
I've seen people who come and sit at the church car park and counting. Hey, how many people are coming into the church today? There are a lot of people today. So today, the pastor has got a lot of money. <laughs> Where did that notion or that idea come from? Where does that idea come from? Where does it come from? We started a prophetic encounter this year. Through it, God has done amazing things. Unusual dimensions of testimonies. The level of the word that is given us is, 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 is beyond human understanding. You and I owe God thanks. I said we owe God thanks. I said we owe God thanks in the name of Jesus. Finally, as we get ready to close. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17 from verse 11 to 19. Let's go and look at a beautiful case studies about Thanksgiving. Luke chapter 17 from verse 11 to 19. The Bible says that now it happened as he went to Jerusalem and he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. I want you to just picture this. This is Jesus. Remember, in those days, they didn't have cars. They had donkeys. But in most of Jesus' journeys, he was walking. He was walking. He will walk miles. Sometimes hours. Sometimes days. Sometimes weeks. So, I want you to just focus and understand this, that Jesus has just walked miles for days and went to Jerusalem and he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. I want you to understand that the Samarians and the Galileans then had issues with the Jews, serious issues. But Jesus had to do this for the sake of some people. You see, most of the time, many church members don't know the price pastors have to pay to stand in front of you to preach. I've always said that our investment in you is a spiritual investment. And so sometimes, because it's a spiritual investment, People don't value and appreciate the level of investments. Are you following what I'm saying? So Jesus had to go for miles and days and weeks just to get here because he wanted to heal some people. Verse 12, the Bible says that then when he entered, then as he entered into a village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. Notice, there met him how many? Ten men who were what? Lepers and they stood where? Afar off. Now, I, I told you earlier, every time you see ten, there's a test. God is about to test you. That's why the tithe is a test. Ten percent is a test. Ten virgins, test. Ten plagues, test. So everywhere you see ten, ten, ten in the Bible, there's about to be a test. A test follows. The Ten Commandments. Your first ten teeth. <laughs> Every time you see a ten, there's a test about to follow. So the Bible says that Jesus, when he entered this village... He deliberately went for these 10 lepers. But look at the price he has to pay to get to these 10 lepers. And sometimes many lepers, many church members don't value the sacrifices men and women of God make. Sometimes they make sacrifices at the expense of their children. At the expense of their children. Struggling in the house, they have to travel sometimes. You see, people think when you are a pastor and you are preaching, traveling from one nation to another, it's fun. It's not fun. 
It's not fun at all. There was a time I was invited to go and preach somewhere. I was preaching in different cities. This person was taking us from one city to another. And then I think we had finished and we're on the plane coming. When we're coming from one of the cities to another city to go and preach, I'm telling you, the turbulence we had in the plane. I, I was sweating so much. My wife is, but I, I had very young children. No will. I, I'll say, oh God, please give me another chance. Don't let me die now. <laughs> if I die in this play here, you know, I, I, I'm telling you, this one, the, it was like the plane was dropping like that. Boom, boom. <laughs> I was sweating. I was, I was praying in all manner of tongues. <laughs> Different kinds of tongues. My wife was asking me, am I okay? I said, I'm okay, but I'm thinking about my children. There's no one to call to say, I love you, my baby. This is my will. No, nothing. Because of the gospel. So when you see men of God traveling, do you, that's what Paul said in, 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 in fastings many. In afflictions many. In shipwrecks many. Are you following what I'm saying? There were many, many afflictions we suffer on the way. Suffering so many things, you have no idea. No idea. Are you following what I'm saying? So Jesus had to go through something to get to these 10 lepers. I want you to just understand what is happening tonight. Jesus had to go through all this pain. All these challenges to get to this point. To come and heal these 10 lepers. And when he saw these 10 lepers, the Bible says that they were afar off. They were standing afar off. Like COVID. Six, six, six foot apart. They have to be afar off. Because you can't be close to one another. And look at what happened, verse 13. The Bible says that, and they, all the 10, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. All of them, they didn't know that it's not about their voices and their cry for mercy that brought Jesus to that city. Jesus came to that village just to heal them. He came to that village just to heal them. And the Bible says, so then he saw them and he said to them, verse 14, when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, isn't it interesting? These are lepers. Oh my God. Leprosy separates you from God. Leprosy is a type of sin that puts a separation between you and God. Any sin that alienates you from the kingdom of God, you must do away with it. Are you following what I'm saying? Because listen, when you're walking in sin, God can hear you. When the sins of the whole world was upon Jesus, Jesus cried and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So when you're walking in sin, God forsakes you. That's why David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sin must not be something we entertain in the church. And sin is sin. We must call sin a sin. If you are sinning, your pastor should be able to see you in the face and tell you, hey, my friend, you are sinning. You can be the biggest giver. If you are sinning, we must tell you you are sinning. Are you following me? So the reason why they were standing afar off and they were separated from Jesus was because of this leprosy, was because of this sin. So the Bible says, so when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. How could Jesus tell them to go show themselves to the priest? Because they are not allowed to go closer to anyone. 
because they are lepers. And lepers were supposed to be in a leprous colony. They were lepers. The Bible says, so it was that as they went, oh, I love this. Jesus saw 10 lepers. They had leprosy. Jesus didn't say be healed. Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest. Why? Because in those days, the priest were the ones who would give you a certificate of cleansing that your leprosy is no longer there. You are now allowed to mingle with people. That's what some people are trying to introduce in this COVID thing. They said if you don't get vaccinated, you won't, you won't get a, a certificate. After vaccination, you'll be given a certificate. And as to whether the vaccination is 666, is the devil or not, is for you to choose. You have the Holy Spirit in you, as the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Don't go and rely on a false doctrine of a prophet somewhere who said this and this and this. My friend, just read between the lines. So the priest will give them a certificate to say, okay, your leprosy is now gone. So now you can come into association. Then look at Jesus. Jesus didn't say, your leprosy is healed. Jesus said, go show yourself. Go show yourself. Go show yourself. This is how thanksgivers operate. Thanksgivers thank God before they see the manifestation. You don't want to see it before you thank God. Say, oh, this is why we change our Thanksgiving services from the last Sunday of every month to the first Sunday of the month. Why? Because we want to thank God in anticipation for what we are believing God for. Jesus said to them, go show yourself to the priest. The Bible says, and as they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. So you see what happens when you start giving God thanks before you, you want to think about the problem. The problem itself takes care of itself. Verse 15, the Bible says, and one of them, one of them, remember, is a test. Is a test. There were 10 who were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. What does the word glorify God there means? He thanked God, glorified, thanksgiving. Where are the other nine? Were there not ten who were healed? Where, why is only one coming back? Where is the other nine? Where is the other nine? So the other nine had an attitude of Jesus, you should have healed us long ago. Jesus, why did you delay? We shouldn't have had leprosy in the first place. They treated God as if God owed them healing. The one, when he saw that he was healed, he returned with a loud voice, glorified God. And next thing he did, the Bible says, and he fell down on his face, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. This is sad. He was not even a church member. He's not even a member of this church. He's not even a member of the church. He's a Samaritan. Sometimes I've seen many people from outside this church who have sown companies that we don't know, we don't have association with, who are sowing into this commission. They are the Samaritans. There are many members outside. We don't know whether they are members or not. They are online members or online viewers who are testifying of what God has done for them through this commission. But there are, there are bona fide members sitting right in front of me in the church, Sunday after Sunday. God have done things for, and they have never opened their mouth to testify. They have never opened their mouth to testify. 
The Bible says, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. He was not a member of the church. He was not a Christian. This is why I said, even unbelievers understand the mystery of thanksgiving more than believers. Believers who think, oh, they want our money. You don't understand how this thing works. Nobody wants your money. Your money is nothing. It's nothing to God. It's, it's, a, it's a test of the heart. God is testing your heart. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? The nine were members of the church. The nine were Christians. The nine were those who knew the word. The nine. Yet, they were the ones who were not found. Sometimes, if you look at people, you'll be deceived. You think this person, no matter what you do, this person is a good person. You vouch for them and they disappoint you. The Bible says that he was a Samaritan. Verse 17, the Bible says, so Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? You see, God demands thanksgiving from us. Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Jesus is asking, were there not ten cleansed? Solution Chapel. Were there not ten healed? Were there not ten blessed? Were there not ten promoted? Were there not ten giving husbands this year? Were there not ten giving houses this year? Were there not ten giving babies this year? Where are the other nine? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? They have forgotten the sacrifice he paid to walk through, to get to Jerusalem. He had to go through Samaria and Galilee. They forgot. They forgot the sacrifice Jesus made to get to them. They forgot. These are people when they come to the church poor and broke. They say, oh, everything is a yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do this. Yes, sir. Be there at 10. Yes, sir. Be there, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Everything you say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The moment they get a little five pounds. Ah. Ah. Every day pastor is calling. Every day pastor. They, they, they now ignore your calls. They ignore your text messages. They ignore your advice. They ignore your counsel because now they think they know better than you. Were there not ten clans? Where are the nine? Where are the other nine? Jesus is looking for you. He is looking for the other nine. God is looking for the other nine. God is looking for you. Where he blessed you. Where are you? Where he blessed you. He's blessed you in this commission. He's blessed you in this church. He's blessed you here. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Sometimes they even leave the church without telling the pastor. They leave the church. You came to the church with nothing. Today you are blessed. And they leave the church without even telling the pastor. Jesus said, where are the other nine? Ten were cleansed. Ten were healed. Ten were blessed. Ten were sanctified. Ten were, were, were promoted. Where are the other nine? And Jesus went further and said, were there not any found who returned? Ten to give glory to God, except this foreigner, except this foreigner, this Samaritan, this foreigner, this stranger, this unbeliever. He understood what it means to give God glory. He understood what it means to thank God. He understood what it means to appreciate. 
appreciate God for all he's done for him. Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed, where are the other nine? Were there not ten cleansed, where are the other nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Except this foreigner. Except this foreigner. What a shame. What a disgrace on Christianity that we don't understand divine protocols. We take everything for granted. That's why I don't tolerate familiarity around me. You can never be here around me and be familiar. Never. 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 Because it doesn't matter the level of anointing you carry. If you don't honor the anointing, the anointing will not work in your life. <clears throat> Jesus said, were there not any found who return to give glory to God except this foreigner? You see, the sad thing about the nine is they think that um, they have arrived. They don't know that just go and show yourself to the high priest. It's just the beginning. <laughs> you come, we pray for you for visa. You get visa, you leave the church. You've forgotten that you are not on indefinite leave to remain. You get to a time where you need to your visa to be extended. And the same people you came to and you abuse them, you will come back again. And unfortunately, many, 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 you know, such people, people who behave like this, they use you as a stairs, step to get to their, their top. Once they put one leg on that step and they get up, they break it, break all the stairs and get up, forgetting that you'll not be up forever. Even Jesus came down from the Mount of Transfiguration. You will be on the mountain forever. <laughs> when you break the stairs and you get up, how are you going to come down? The same stairs you took up, you needed to come down. Stop breaking the steps. Stop using people. So stop abusing people. I've heard many pastors saying, ah, these people, they are here for a short time, so just use them. I said, no, it doesn't work like that. So even many pastors think, ah, the people are just here for a short time. Once they, they hear a latest prophet in town, they'll move, they'll, move, they'll move church. Because there are many Christians who are on disloyal. They are no longer loyal to anything. Sometimes even, even they leave, they leave their matrimonial home. They leave. They leave their husband, they leave their children and just walk out and go. No commitment, nothing. They've forgotten the vow they have taken. Sometimes it's either the man or the woman. They just leave, get up and go because of another woman. Hey. So some pastor says, ah, these people, they are just here for a short time. Just use them. If you don't use them, you will regret. The devil is a liar. We are not here to use people. We are here to raise people. We are not here to raise money. We are here to raise giants. Glory. That's why money has never been the focus of my ministry. Never. That's why, if you notice, I don't take offering in this church. Was the last time you saw me, it's time to give praise the Lord. And I quote 20 scriptures. I tell my pastors, when it's time for offering, please don't read any long scripture. Please. I mean, the Bible says that God opened the heart of women in the city to sow into the ministry of Paul. You see, when it comes to ministry, God has to open the heart of the people. If God has not opened the heart of the people, it doesn't matter the tongues you pray. I've seen, I've seen men of God who claim to be expert fundraisers. 
and they go to a fundraiser and say, who is going to give a thousand? First person, thousand, thousand, <laughs> nobody gets up. 500, 500, nobody gets up. 250, 250, nobody gets up. 100, nobody. Okay, let's make it 10, nobody. One, nobody. So if God doesn't open the heart of the people, forget it. If your heart is not committed, connected to this commission, forget it. It doesn't matter what I say, you can't be blessed here. Jesus said, were there not any fan who return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Verse 19, finally, the Bible says that, and Jesus said to him, the one who returned, the foreigner, Jesus said, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Glory be to God. The King James said, your faith has made you whole. I prophesy over you today that you are whole. 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 Your family is whole. Your finances is whole. Your business is whole. In the mighty name of Jesus, there shall no longer be depreci depreciation in your life. You will never go down from henceforth. From henceforth, you will do wondrous works. From henceforth, you will do wondrous works. In the mighty name of Jesus. I prophesy over you that through thanksgiving, God will open the cities unto you. God will open the nations unto you. God will perfect your healing. In the name of Jesus, God will do great and mighty things in your life. In the name of Jesus, I prophesy it over your life. I declare you blessed. I declare you favored. I cure you of any spirit of ingratitude. I cure you of any spirit of ingratitude. From henceforth, you will be grateful. You'll be a grateful Christian. You'll be thankful unto God, even in the little things. And God will multiply it. Because God says we must not despise the day of small beginnings. As you thank God in the little, the little will increase. The little will multiply. The little will become big in the mighty name of Jesus. For those of you believing God for the fruit of the womb, I prophesy you next year by this time, you have a child crying in your house. For those of you believing God for a marriage partner, I prophesy that that man is coming. Amen. That woman is coming in the name of Jesus. Some of you are going to receive your proposals before the end of this year. In the mighty name of Jesus, you'll enter 2021 with a big bank. With a big bank. With a big bank in the name of Jesus. Thanksgiving is a key. Let's learn to thank God. Let's learn to be grateful. And as we do that, God will bless us. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Let's prepare the communion elements before we partake of the communion. If you are, if you are watching and you haven't given your life to Jesus, I would like to pray for you. I'd like to pray for you. Say with me, Lord Jesus. I come to you just as I am. Forgive me of my sins. Write my name in your book of life. From today, I have decided to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let's prepare the communion elements. Prepare your communion element. <clears throat> Remember, tomorrow is our special anointing service to complete it all. It's going to be an anointing and communion service. You don't want to miss it. This communion, as we are partaking it, is to release the spirit of thanksgiving. Amen. The spirit of gratitude. The spirit of gratitude. 
a spirit of gratitude in the name of Jesus. That bread is blessed. The body of Christ is blessed. That bread now becomes the body of Christ. As you partake of it, complete healing. Jesus is healing you. Jesus is healing you. Exploits, 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 gateways to exploits. Turn around testimonies. Turn around testimonies. Turn around testimonies in the mighty name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The body of Christ, take and eat. The same way he took the cup. He said, this is a cup of my new covenant. It's a cup of, cup of the new covenant. It's a new covenant. We are entering into a new covenant with God. A covenant of being grateful. A covenant of not forgetting. A covenant of remembrance. A covenant of knowing that where we are is by the grace of God. The blood of Jesus. Take and drink. Somebody has just received their healing. Amen. Permanent healing. Permanent healing. Open doors. Somebody is just receiving open doors right now. Doors have been opened. Everlasting gates that have been shut against you are being opened now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. We love you with all our hearts. We exalt you in Jesus' name. May we never become forgetful hearers of your word, but may we be doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat>